I'm Bill Rasmussen. I'm Senior Museum Collections Curator at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Now, I've had the time recently to study in a little bit of depth three very important objects in our collection. They're deep in storage because they're in need of conservation. A portrait of James Madison, a portrait of Dolly Madison, and a huge French wallpaper scene that uh, done in the 1830s that depicts Natural Bridge of Virginia with some of Virginia's inhabitants in the foreground. Um, they're not on display because they're very fragile, uh, because they both are painted on paper, and the paper is, is, was glued to wood, and that's not a good recipe for preservation over 200 years. The wood and the paper expand and contract at different rates with changes in temperature and humidity. And the pieces are at the point now where they have to be stored in a very secure uh, environment in terms of humidity and temperature change. And they have to be stored horizontally because paint pigments could literally fall off of them um, if they're not stored that way. So they need to be conserved. And I wanted to determine just how important these objects are. And um, it's been a very rewarding uh, bit of research because I found that they're even more important than I thought they were. So let me start, first of all, with the portrait of James Madison. It's a life portrait. It means it was painted with the artist standing right in front of him, no doubt talking to him. And we see James Madison as he presented himself to the public in 1816, which we'll find out was a very important time for him, the end of a 40-year career in public service. Um, he's a very popular figure today. He's certainly important to us at the at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture because he was the first honorary member of the Virginia Historical Society shortly after it was founded in 1831. Um, he's very popular today. Um, we, we see pundits on television, read them in the editorial pages, and they talk a great deal about the, uh, the struggles for power between the executive branch and the legislative legislative branch. And then they say, well, we no, no need to worry because James Madison anticipated all that. He put all sorts of checks and balances into the Constitution. And that's true. And what's, what's particularly interesting is that he was just as popular in his own lifetime. He was called the father of the Constitution, and he was also called the father of the Bill of Rights. And uh, he was one of the, arguably, the the two most indispensable founders. The other one, of course, was George Washington, also a father, father, father of the country. And Madison earned that praise because he's the one that wants the Constitutional Convention uh, after having done a lot of study of past democracies and republics. Uh, Jefferson was in Paris. He sent uh, Madison trunk loads full of books of history books about all the dem democracies and republics of the past centuries in Europe and even going back to the ancient world. So Madison came to the convention prepared to talk about what would work and what wouldn't. He knew enough to orchestrate how the convention was going to be run. He was able to answer other people's ideas with historical precedent uh, to give an opinion on him. He was able to come up with an agenda for the for the convention. He was able to come forward with a program uh, for what the Constitution should be, and essentially that's what 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 happened. Um, and he was able to he had a, he played a huge part in the ratification of the of the Constitution because he and Hamilton and John Jay wrote the remarkable Federalist Papers that are considered to this day some of the finest. Uh, um, political interpretation ever ever made. Um, and then what's interesting about Madison is that he, he went on and throughout his 40-year career, he was always on the winning side. Um, he got the way of the Constitution, although at the time he, he was greatly disappointed. He left the convention telling Jefferson that he had failed because there were a number of compromises and he wanted to give, Madison wanted to give the federal government more power but he had to make compromises. It turned out that was just as well um, because the, con the Constitution would almost certainly wouldn't have been ratified had those compromises, which gave the states more power, not been made. 
And then he served in a prominent role in Congress during Washington's presidencies. And he and Jefferson founded a political party. And then that political party elected Jefferson president for eight years. And then Madison was his secretary of state uh, under Jefferson. And then Madison was himself elected president for two terms. Um, and, and so in our, our portrait shows him right at the end of that 40 year period at the end of his two terms as, um, as, as president. It was painted by Joseph Wood, who had, whose career to that point, he had, he had been mainly um, a, a miniature painting, painter, which means he was looking at people's faces and he was giving um, um, very um, powerful images of people that, 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 that showed very, very thoughtful uh, faces. Uh, uh, and, and Madison at this point um, had, had led a long, uh, an incredibly eventful life. Um, and he's shown here with a lot of dignity um, and a lot of character. And he seems almost ready to speak to us. Um, at the least, we can say Joseph Wood presented him to us as Madison presented himself to the, to the world in um, 1816. Um, these are probably, this portrait and the one of Dolly Madison are probably the best ones that Joseph Wood ever painted. Um, his career falls apart soon after this, and like his mentor earlier, the portraitist John Wesley Jarvis, he took to alcohol and then he pretty much disappears from the scene. Uh, so these were painted at the peak of his, of his career. Madison gave them to his good friend Richard Bland Lee of Virginia, whose brother is more famous. Brother was Lighthouse Harry Lee, the father of Robert E. Lee. And Lee had served on a commission that Madison set up as president uh, to award reparations to people who, who lost um, who lost property during the during the War of eighteen twelve. And they descended in the family of Richard uh, Land Lee. Uh, and until the 1960s, when his direct descendant gave them to the Virginia Historical Society, so that's um, that's how we acquired them. Now, so we look at that face uh, and that portrait, and we think, what was on his mind? Um, and we can guess a little bit about that because there are documents that there are records that tell us uh, what he was thinking about. Uh, one thing he was thinking about was his legacy. He was very concerned about his legacy. He um, he was praised in his lifetime, as I said, as the father of the Constitution and the father of the Bill of Rights. But as president, he had allowed the War of 1812 to happen. And historians, a group of historians 10 or 15 years ago, listed that as one of the greatest presidential disasters in the history of America. We shouldn't have gone to war with Great Britain. We had no Navy. Uh, we had no, had no bank at that time. To, and no, with, we had no funds to finance the war. So the war uh, was a blight on his character, and Madison was greatly concerned about his legacy. And one reason we know that he was, was that he went through his letters uh, uh, soon after this portrait was painted and started changing them. He started editing them. He started saying, he started changing things of what, what he should have said, which sounds like a very strange thing to do, except we'd know that George Washington was doing the same thing uh, uh, at the end of his life. He was editing his letters and improving what he what he said, you know, and I think the, they, they, they figured that the letters would be published in book form, so wouldn't, no one would see that they were making changes on the actual manuscripts, which, which, and of course that's visible. Another thing that he was thinking about, and that we can think about as we look at that portrait, he's thinking a lot about slavery. Um, he was visited at Monticello uh, in the early 1830s by a French uh, writer, uh, Harriet Martineau, and she gives a vivid description of talking with him, and she said that the only thing he talked about was slavery. And he said it just greatly bothered him. Um, he, he knew it was wrong, he knew it needed to be corrected, but he didn't know how to correct it. Um, so that was something else that was, was on his mind. And he lived, um, he lived for 20 years after this portrait was painted. Now, if we turn to the portrait of his wife, Dolly Madison, um, she's certainly an interesting figure as well. She was one of the most accomplished women in all of American history. And he again, would, again gives us a sitter with a very thoughtful gaze, um, uh, is expressive of her, of her 
intellect and her experience um, that earned her the praise of, of Washington society. She was accomplished as first lady. The term didn't exist then, but that was what, what she would, what we, that's a term that we know today to describe what she was doing. She served in that capacity for Jefferson because he was a widow. So for eight years for Jefferson, then eight years as um, her husband's first lady, um, she led Washington society. And one thing that she did that was um, admirable is that she invited members of both parties to come to events, social events at the White House. And that was a a, a good precedent that that, um, that she established. She's famous for saving the Lansdowne portrait of George Washington and the great standing portrait of Washington. Um, and she directed um, her slave as well as one of the uh, staff members there who was in charge of, of arranging ceremonies at the White House. And, um, and they saved, saved the paintings. Now I mentioned the slave, and that's a bit of a uh, uh, that that seems rather strange, given the fact that she was raised as a Quaker, and that the Quakers uh, 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 detested slavery. Her parents had had freed their slaves. She had married first um, a, a Philadelphia lawyer named John Todd uh, in 1790, and then three years later in the Yellow Fever during the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, he died, as did one of their two children. The other child uh, survived, Payne Todd, uh, and it, when he was two years old when she married James Madison. James Madison was 17 years her senior. Um, she was 26 years old, he was 43. And um, Madison, James Madison, helped raise Payne Todd. He turned out to be something more problem in old age than in that he ended up in debtor's prison. And um, he was a drain on the finances of the family, particularly on the finances of Dolly Madison after her husband had died. And she ended up in poverty uh, because of that. She ended up having to sell um, her husband's papers to the federal government. And she also ended up having to sell Montpelier. So both of these portraits certainly are, are, are very interesting and, um, and um, worthy of, of saving and, and sharing with the world. I want to turn now to the wallpaper panel, which is a rather amazing piece. Um, it was made by a French company that is still in existence called Zuber, Z-U-B-E-R. Um, or Zuber and Company. Its, its headquarters is still located in France, in the northeastern part of France, in Alsace, Alsace near, the, near the French border. They have a wonderful website. So if you would like, to, they're still making these papers. If you'd like to buy some, you can go to the website. But I would encourage you to go to the website, and all you need to do is to Google Zuber, Z-U-B-E-R, wallpaper. And they have a video that shows how they make the, the, the pieces. And um, when I um, first read about how they ha have 150,000 wood blocks in their basements uh, and how laborious these, the process of making the wallpaper is, I th thought it couldn't possibly be true. But the video shows that it is true and that they had, well, they were particularly active from when they founded, were founded in 1797 up until the 1830s uh, when they have they were employing um, 50 woodcutters now what the woodcutters would do they take a block of wood which is about the size of a piece of paper and some were a little larger and some were smaller and they would cut out uh, the background and they'd leave only the the image that they wanted to depict in the scene so if it was a tree or a person or a ship they would leave that there and so you could end up having for a scene um, these, this was, these were done in strips, just like wallpaper today. So it's a seven foot long strip, maybe two feet, about two feet wide. And for each of the elements of the scene, um, you would have different blocks and you could have, um, easily a hundred blocks or more, or, or even several hundred, up to a thousand blocks for a scene. Cause these, these scenes were parts of long series. Now the view, the, the, 
The image that we have of Virginia is one of five in the series called Views of North America. And they're panoramic scenes. The other four scenes are in the north. They're of Boston Harbor, uh, the New York Bay, uh, Niagara Falls, and uh, West Point, the Hudson River at West Point. And, and if you stretch them all out, they, would, um, they run about 32 feet. So it's an enormous expanse of, of wall surface that, that is covered with these blocks. The, um, the series, The Views of North America, became famous in 1961 when Jackie Kennedy had it installed in the White House, and it's still there in the diplomatic reception rooms where a number of events are held, and you can see it in the background on television um, every now and then. So this, this, this wallpaper company, named for Jean Zuber, um, is still in existence. It was the leading one. And it's the only wallpaper company that's still doing still doing this. Uh, these wallpapers came became in vogue because they were cheaper than what had been used in in great houses before to put on the walls. They're cheaper than they're cheaper than tapestries, uh, uh, and and they were cheaper than Chinese wallpapers that were were made, and cheaper than embroidered wall hangings. Um, and they and they they became popular, um, and the way the, the the they're so powerful artistically, because the the man, the, the leading artist in all this was named uh, Dantil Jean Julien Dantil, and he is the one that conceived and drew the series of views of, of North America, and he just went to a, a, enormous efforts to create wonderful detail and, and vivid colors. And so if when, the, when the, the people working the wood blocks would apply a color, they would apply on that one panel as many of say green or red or whatever it was, and then they would put it up and hang it up to dry. And you can see on the video on the Zuber website that uh, they'd put a bunch of them, because if you go into all the trouble of making your own paint for this particular color and making sure it's the right hue, um, you're going to do a bunch of them at the same time. So they could have, a well, you can see in the, in the video as many as a dozen of this particular strip being done um, at a time. Then they hang it up, wait 24 hours, and then they bring it back down and start adding and add another color. And the result of all of this is the colors don't get mixed, they don't get muddy, and they just jump because they're so vivid and, and bright. So this particular scene is, 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 is of great importance to us um, for, for at least two reasons. First, it was painted in the, it was conceived and first painted in the 1830s. And at that point, uh, Virginians, the Virginia dynasty was over. The Virginia dynasty that produced four of the first five presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, had ended at, at the end of um, Monroe's term second term in 1825, and Virginians were concerned that they were no longer in the forefront on the national political stage. And they were concerned that Virginians were leaving, um, were leaving Virginia. They conceived of the world, of the term old Virginia to say, to think how great the, the, uh, the nation had been. And they established the Virginia Historical Society at that point to save documents and records and art to show um, what had been achieved by Virginia's founding um, fathers. So it's, a, it's an important date for our institution. And the second reason is that they give us a different perspective of how Virginia was viewed at exactly this time by a foreign nation, by France. Um, and it had a, a very high reputation there, obviously, with this strange, with this, with this scene, uh, which is um, is rather remarkable for, for some of the strange elements that are in it. Uh, but it is a rich historical artifact because it's full of information about French thinking um, at this time. To the, 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 the French were enthrall, enthralled by the United, this new United States, and they saw it as a fledgling nation um, in the midst of developing <clears throat> a great democracy. And so a number of French artists and writers published lithographs and travel accounts about the new nation because there was an eager audience in France who wanted to learn about it. 
And in this, this vision that Jean Dantil gives us here, Virginia is characterized by a resident aristocracy of which to French observers, Thomas Jefferson had been the consummate exemplar. Um, and there are also Native Americans we see here, and they're African Americans, and there are great, and there is at least one great natural wonder here, the the, the, the natural bridge in, in Rockbridge County, and Don Teal depicted the natural bridge in a very strange, <coughs> in a very strange manner. Strange enough that we know exactly where he got it. It was from a French artist um, named Milbert. Uh, Jacques Gerard Milbert, who had published um, picturesque um, views of the Hudson River and other parts of America, and he showed the, the bridge in this in this remarkably sublime image. It looks it, it's it's more towering than in reality, obviously. And then he gives us the um, these lively characters in there. Um, which are uh, exaggerated, uh, to say the least. But Alex de Tocqueville, <clears throat> the famous writer in his Democracy in America, which appeared very soon after this, talked about the same thing, the three races that inhabit the United States. And so the French were, were interested and came up with this distinctive, skewed identity of what, of what Virginia and America was composed of. Now, a number of Virginia's founding fathers were, were revered in, in France, particularly George Washington, who was revered throughout the, the Europe. <clears throat> but Jefferson had the greatest popularity because he had been the, the American ambassador there in the 1780s, and he was accepted as a cultivated um, aristocratic gentleman. He had written his notes on the state of Virginia. Um, it was first published in France and in French, in 1784 and 85, um, it had been written into a, in response to a request from the secretary of the French legation in Philadelphia at the time. And Jefferson talked about the, the um, he's particularly interested in the North American species of, 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 of wildlife because they were, uh, America's, uh, America's wildlife was criticized, particularly by the Comte de Buffon, who, who thought that the, American species had degenerated and were inferior to their European counterparts. Um, but Jefferson also took this up as an opportunity to comment on Virginia's Indian population and to comment on, on slavery. Um, and he talked about how Natural Bridge was one of the natural wonders of America, and he encouraged his readers to make a trip across the ocean just to see it. And he was, Jefferson was so enthralled with Natural Bridge that he eventually purchased it himself and owned it. Um, so, he, and he kept up his allegiance to France, even during the uh, presidencies of, of Washington and Adams, when the, uh, the British-leaning Federalists uh, were arguing against France and arguing in favor of an alliance with Britain. And um, Jefferson maintained his loyalty to the French, even during the French Revolution. Um, and so that was recognized in France and appreciated it. And no doubt during his, when he was president and, he, and the negotiations were carried out there by James Monroe and Robert Livingston to purchase for the Louisiana Purchase, no doubt <clears throat> Jefferson's reputation in France was, was a positive factor. And then this French interest in Virginia is further explained by the American Revolution, because of course it was, it was the involvement of Generals Lafayette and then Rochambeau um, and the Comte de Grasse, particularly during the Yorktown campaign in 1781, that played a large part in, in the American victory. Um, and so the French paid attention, even through their own tumultuous revolution, to what was going on in this young nation, uh, America. And so Dentil gives them, gives them something to keep them, keep, to, to, to keep their interests going. He, um, he shows Indians who are pictured in rather strange costumes that may have come from illustrations of South American Indians. It may have come from some of the images being produced out of Thomas 
McKinney, uh, who was the head of the U.S. Bureau of Indian uh, Affairs, and he was some of his publications showed costumes. Of course, they, these what we see in the wallpaper are not accurate depictions, but more important than that is the fact that this these depict natural man. This was the old the idea that the made famous by the French philosopher Jean Jacques Rousseau, who came up with the idea that that a man living in a, a man living in a natural environment was perhaps more virtuous than man living in the corrupt evil cities of civilized Europe. And this was the same idea that, that Gauguin took to, to Tahiti. And the idea that natural man is perhaps has virtue. It was a myth that appealed to the Europeans. This is Virgil's is it what they thought about Virgil's shepherds shepherds and their pastoral simplicity. And this was of interest, according to the scene, to the white viewers of what's going on here, because they seem to be enjoying this depiction. And the black people here are depicted as as free, well dressed, cosmopolitan, um, as blacks may have appeared at Paris at the time. And European writers, visitors who had gone to Philadelphia and New York. Put, put out accounts that they had seen black figures like this in those two cities. And so Don Teal brought that idea, which total myth uh, to Virginia, but there, there it is. And then uh, as much a myth as this carriage on the right that speeds off, um, purely a, uh, an element of Don Teal's imagination. Um, we don't know the history of this of our of our wallpaper panorama. Um, we don't know what what house it, it appeared it was first uh, installed in. We don't know what happened to the other four scenes of the views of North America. We know obviously that it was taken down at some point and put on panels um, as a way to preserve it. <clears throat> and um, it was acquired for us um, fifteen years or so. Um, by Laura Robbins. And that's how we have it. Um, and uh, we're certainly glad that we have it and that we have the two portraits of um, James and of Dolly Madison. And um, I hope I've been able to interest you in them um, at least a little as much as, as, as I've become um, involved with them. And I hope you will take a look at the, at the Zuber um, website, Z-U-B-E-R, and take a look at that. You'll, it'll give you a new appreciation of our panoramic wallpaper view of Virginia's Natural Bridge.